today we've got Brian Green doing a great talk on us. Brian, just to introduce him, Cloud Data Architect at Aurus Surgical Ro Robotics. Um, he's been in the industry for 15 plus years doing everything from you know, hands-on coding to, to running <laughs> teams. And I also just recently found out that he's a, a master woodworker as well. So, Brian, over to you. Thank you. I, first time in my life I've ever been introduced, so I really appreciate that. Um, as you said, my name is Brian Green. Um, I started with uh, Oris Health, so we recently renamed. I um, started with Oris Health about 16 months ago. Um, I've been really excited to go to work every day, and I'm really excited that you're here and you, you want to hear about it. Um, so with that, who is Oris Health? Um, I'm not sure we're quite a household name yet, so we're going to talk a little bit about us, give you the context of our data. Where does it come from? What do we want to do with it? That kind of thing. We'll talk more about our goals. What are some inputs? So I said, you know, 16 months-ish. What were the inputs that I started with? You know, I think that examining the current state is always useful before you talk about what you did. Um, then we're going to go through the journey. It's a bit of a whirlwind. Um, it's been a fun time. And then we'll do a little Q&A. So first, who is Aura's Health? That last slide showed you a picture of well, the Monarch, the Monarch Robotic Assisted Endoscopic Bronchoscopic Platform. Diagnostic Bronchoscopic Platform. I almost got it. Um, <laughs> we recently received 510 clay clearance for this, so this is, a, this is our first release device. Um, what you see is a clinician doing what we call driving, driving a bronchoscope uh, down through the patient's airways. Um, to find and diagnose uh, lung cancer. So why lung cancer? Why would we go after this? Uh, it kills more people globally than prostate, breast, and colon cancer combined. This is the number one cancer killer globally. It's also incredibly difficult to diagnose due to the fact that many of the tumors that you'd wish to get biopsies on are in the outer periphery of the lung. Um, they're hard to get to. You can't navigate your way to them, and you can't see them until the monarch. So, with increased navigation and increased visibility and increased control for the clinician, rather than trying to stuff a wet hose down the patient's uh, airway, you have this nice robotic control. Um, we aim to, to you know, help diagnose now and eventually treat um, lung cancer. Um, a little bit about me, I started in 2003. Um, as he said, business intelligence, web app development, um, systems integration, middleware, was a great time, and then a couple of years in enterprise architecture, um, which was a different, a different view of the world, and then, um, and then back down to getting my hands dirty at Oris. So when I showed up, I mean, it's, it's a surgical robot. I knew that, so I'm immediately like, what kind of questions are they going to ask me about a surgical robot, and what kind of data stuff that you can do? What's a visionary outcome? You know, think big there, because it seems like we do have a lot of data. Uh, well-designed robots generate incredible amounts of telemetry information. It seems like if you generate that much data, if you can track what the clinician is doing, eventually you ought to be able to help them. You ought to be able to give them guidance during the procedures, all kinds of use cases where you should be able to take the data you've gathered from a successful clinical operation and turn it into augmentation, make the clinician better, right? Makes sense to me. Uh, it seems like a Pretty big goal, though. It's quite a North Star. So there's a number of other obvious use cases along the way. Air quotes, obvious. We're going to talk through those. Um, we're going to talk about what does it mean to, you know, well-designed robot in terms of the data that it produces for us. Um, you know, I wanted to make this very clear. It does get, I was, my first suspicion when I showed up was that the robot wouldn't produce enough data. And that the first thing I was going to have to do was ask them to do all kinds of work to produce more information for me. And in fact, it generates an incredible amount of information, um, a rich set of opportunities. So with that target in mind, what do you do? I said we'd go through the first like year and a half. So I started with a pretty blank slate. We were putting data in AWS, and that was it. We weren't even using it once it was in AWS. So we wanted to do some context setting, because a lot of people had these very lofty goals, like you should be able to tell the clinician this thing about the patient while they're in the operatory. And that goal, you know, it's going to take a year and a half of data before we could, you know, come up with that. So where are your questions on this pyramid? And let's set some non-technical, non-buzzword-based expectations about what you're asking us to do. Because what we have now is data just at the bottom. And we have all these goals. So what are some goals? Physical mechatronics is the easy one. It's a robot. So the first question you ask is, is the machine broken? Is the machine going to break? Why did the machine break? Before the machine breaks, which part should you replace? 
there's a standard kind of flow of maturity there around diagnostics of physical machines. Uh, I think we've seen the commercials from a major vendor where it does that for airlines. Um, then we move into the software layers. Uh, you know, one of our key, uh, uh, key benefits is the advanced software that we use. It generates an incredible amount of telemetry. We ought to be able to analyze that for simple things like regression testing, making sure that the performance between all the layers is continuing to work the way it's supposed to, up to more advanced user interface. So it's a touch screen and a, a hand controller, and we gather all of the user input. So we get to questions you know, down the road like, in the clinical workflow, the user is supposed to click this button. But every time, you know, one and a half percent of the time, they click to the lower left by four pixels and they miss it, and then they actually do click the button. Is the button in the wrong place? Is the button not big enough? User experience is actually a regulated facet of a medical device. So managing that and proving that you're thinking through the user experience is a regulated thing that we have to do. So lots of opportunities at the software layer. And now at this top level user interaction layer, how can we use the data that we generated to make the, the physician more efficient, right? So if it's more efficient, the patient's in and out quicker, and it's better for the patient, it's better for the facility, how can we make them more precise? If we have the information about thousands of successful procedures, how do we quantify what success is and can we guide you towards it? Finally, you have enough data in the medical space, you don't just get to make claims that you do something better. Over time, we generate enough data and we start to be able to prove things about clinical outcomes. More patients survive longer, right? We're not there yet. Again, it takes a lot of data and time to do that kind of thing. But those are your top level goals in that user interaction. We're up in that wisdom, right? So what do we do? Each area, each one of these facets climbs this pyramid at a different speed. Um, and that drives all kinds of different priority and different demands. So some people will say, don't talk to me until you have knowledge. And then I know people in our company who said, come back to me when you can do that in a year or two. And other people say, I'm really interested in information. Just help me get there. I'm going to do my own data engineering, right? So be you know, cognizant of that across the organization. Our goal is to build a platform that serves everybody. What is their engagement model? I love the embedded analyst model. You know, we've talked about self-service. I've been hearing about self-service for 10, 15 years, long time. Um, some of our customers don't want that. Some of our customers really do say, we have budget, we'll give you money, make it happen for us. Um, we talked about how do, we st you know, how do we build a team that accommodates that model, and then how do we go after self-service is our goal anyway. Um, pay attention to the stakeholders, each one of these. So we have stakeholders that cover the entire organization. Uh, my boss routinely meets with all of the VPs across the organization. We're supposed to be kind of the fountain of, of data value. And finally, opinions. There are lots of opinions that you'll hear as you're moving through your journey, um, from what platform you should use to which version of a tool you should use. Um, you know, many of your peers will have come from another organization where they probably interacted with some kind of data and analytics. They may either think that you're amazing because of what you're doing, or terrible because you're not doing what they got to experience somewhere else. So lots of those, be cognizant of those. Those are critical. So we use this pyramid. We consistently go back to this and use it to level set state. People get a little ahead of themselves about what we should be able to do or et cetera. We can come back to this and say, we understand the journey that we're going on. So inputs and requirements, constraints. I'm going to go through this pretty fast. Architecture requirements, Occam's razor. Build the simplest possible thing that works. We would call this the MVP. It's a little bit bigger than that, though, because my goal is to build an architecture that will suit this company you know, in a year, a year and a half, when they start selling this robot into the field. right? And be ready for it. So build the simplest thing that you possibly can that will solve all of the use cases that we think we're going to have. OK. Be agile and cloudy. And agile in this case is not just agile software development. It really is, you know, you're the data team. You might be subject to somebody changing all of the data streams that they're sending you, which happens to us, by the way. It turns out to be a great thing. We you know, collaborated with the other teams. But um, be, be agile that way around what you're building. Be cloudy. So we have a very cloud-first strategy. OK, this one sounds more specific. Human platform service and technology acquisition strategy. Whew. If you listen to the keynote this morning, you know, we have a, a sort of a hierarchy that we walk through when we're trying to figure out what, uh, how to fulfill a technical capability. And the first one is that it needs to be a completely serverless managed platform. Things like S3, Dynamo, right? I don't want to think at all about the infrastructure. 
After that, we go after big managed platforms. That's where Kubel fits for me. That is a, that is a category that Kubel would fit, fits in for me. It is a platform that manages a whole bunch of infrastructure. I don't have to think about it. Um, we extensively use Lambda functions, right? So all of that serverless stuff. If we have to manage a server, you better figure out how to put it in a container and get the logs redirected somewhere else, right? We don't, the goal is don't manage infrastructure. After that, pay attention to languages. So we have a preference for open source in the languages that we like. Just because it's open source, if 90% of your code's in Python and this new open source library is in Go, Go might be the best language ever but it doesn't fit into my overall ecosystem. So pick a couple of standards. We pick Python as our first preference, Java as the second. Matches the entire ecosystem pretty easy. Anticipate scale. Everybody tells you to do this, but I'm told on day one, we believe that data is a pillar of value for our organization and we are all going to come to you. Like we started with a good data strategy. I don't have those layers to walk through, right? Our, our board of directors and some other folks are very clear about how they think this should go. So be ready for it. Look at the sales projections and then start trying to make guesses because when the data comes in, it's gonna come in fast and that value needs to be there. Oh, we make medical devices. So consider 21 CFR, which is the laws from the FDA around medical devices. HIPAA, lots of HIPAA concerns. NIST is a framework. There's a long list here if we leave the United States and a bunch of other regulations. Test and document enough. We're not currently part of the medical device, but the goal is at some point we will be. How do you do a medical device in the cloud? It's possible, but doing medical devices requires a level of documentation and control that is foreign to many data teams. Um, so do this enough so that you're ready when you need to turn the volume up from a regulatory standpoint and you want to become a more formal thing. Be shiny. <laughs> What does this look like? I was told we're a Bay Area startup. We, we will use the latest and greatest. Pay attention to the market. Go out there and look at what's going on and do that. Go do what winning people are doing. I think that's what we're all told. Ready? Big data, pretty obvious. Serverless APIs and microservices. You gotta do all those things. You gotta do AI and ML. Can't win without that. Gotta do CI and CD, DevOps too. Make sure you're doing all those things. We have to have 12 factor apps. If you haven't read about it, you should go read it. It will change your life. IoT. Every, we're doing IoT, I mean clearly we have devices, they're on the internet, it must be an IoT thing. Containers, we have to have containers. We probably should have some long arguments about Kubernetes versus some other container management, whatever. You guys, I missed like 10 I'm sure, so insert whatever your C-level executive is telling you you should think about into this cloud. Um, oh, frameworks, ITIL, COBIT, EA, the, web app, the, the well-architected framework from AWS is a great piece of literature. Uh, NIST again, right? Think a lot about security, it's med tech, it's in the cloud. This feels like a freight train bearing down on me. I have no idea how am I gonna do this? Because I know what the goal is, you know, be in production at this time and meet, you know, meet these goals, empower these users. So I actually think that we all have this problem. They asked me to do this talk, I had a really hard time figuring out what I was gonna say. Because what I, all I did was take these inputs and then the other constraints, things like schedule, and the, you know, the, the company's preferences for technology and budget. I didn't even talk about money, we won't talk about that. Staff, how big is the team? How much money do I have to go you know, get other contracts? I won't even talk about that stuff. Take all this stuff, put it in a box and shake it and do the nicest thing you can in, in, in those constraints. That's, that's what we did. But how? I was spent you know, a week or so trying to figure out how to talk about it. And the answer is this. <laughs> All through our architecture, in many discussions, you'll hear Kevin and I talk, we talk almost every day, and you'll talk about, you know, we can do this, this, or this, we know what the best practice is, we're gonna leave a hook in place, we're gonna leave a trail there, we're gonna leave a note, we're gonna put a task in the log, we're gonna, right? We know what we're supposed to do, but we don't have the scale for that. So you act in terms of best practice, right? But you balance, you can't religiously hang on to any one of those frameworks or sets of guidelines or it'll, it'll burn you out. And, and that's it. So what's it look like really quick? So we made this map and, uh, and started iterating towards it. And I'm gonna walk you through those iterations fairly quickly. First 60 days, we drew the map and, and because they said, hey, we what's your plan? Tell us what you're gonna build. You know, year, year and a half out, what are you gonna have? Um, so this is what it looks like. And then start picking technologies. We picked 90% of the technologies in the first 60 days. Uh, and we had our first ingestion function, so you heat, you know, left to right kind of standard data flow drawing. The data comes in from a few places. Technically goes into S3, but Lambda is our ingestion. So everything we do, it hits S3. We use Lambda to process it, figure out what we're gonna do from there. 
um, it runs down through the rest of this we'll talk through. So we had our first one done. We were proving that we could ingest these you know, encrypted, uh, uh, compressed binary files, turn them into human usable and big data usable CSVs downstream. Queries on some data, we had to prove that you could write a query against this. I mean, some of this is a sale job to tell our engineering group who'd already for three years been successfully reading these logs with tools that they'd built. So I'm telling them you need this whole new fancy thing in the cloud, and they're saying, but I can already read the log files on my laptop. Why do I need you, right? So we had to keep demonstrating these little, little things as we worked our way through. The, so the first queries were successful, and people said, okay, that's interesting. Actually, we had a senior engineer say, isn't that just like pushing control F? Like, why do we need big data? It's just a text file. I, I didn't even know how to reply. So we demonstrated some queries. We did a lot more drawings. There's a ton of drawings behind this. We solidified this translator. So I said we had a big refactoring. So we went from two stream types to 10, um, which was great. We started getting some intermittent batch processing into Hive. So we had Kubel online, and we started getting some stuff in there. We started getting some end users into writing notebooks in Spark and, and Python. And, and it, was, uh, you know, it, was, it, was, it was rough getting them in there, right? Uh, our users, some of them, most of them actually don't know SQL. So the first thing we do is to train people to write a select statement and teach people that you don't do iteration in data science, you don't do iteration in Spark, you know, it's set based, and so sort of teaching people how to think that way. But we got our first users in there. Um, we started getting this thing load tested. So remember I said balance and anticipate scale. So as we iterate through this, left to right, if you could watch this heat map, the things in the lower left here in the bottom are just getting stronger and stronger as we move and we mature through. So now we've got automated load testing running against this. We'll show you some results of that in a minute. Um, we have Kubel officially live. So we've got our first what, 25 or 28 users signed in. Uh, we got our first APIs live. So the data comes in. This is a very classic you know, big data lambda architecture where the data flows through the stages, ends up in a relational database and some other places, and it can serve APIs and et cetera. So our top layer, our user interface layer, is served via API there. So we got our first one live in, in Q4, which is exciting. We got Airflow online, Q1 of 2018, which was kind of fun. Uh, I'd love to, I could spend all afternoon talking about that fun thing. Uh, integration tests are automated, and we've got our you know, 25 plus users with training. So we brought Kubel in, they did some training, and we, we really saw a good uptake in utilization. Uh, getting all of the integration, you know, so we got continuous integration, continuous delivery now running for 75 or 85 percent of what's there. It's actually a fair bit of the Kubel stuff isn't automated yet, but everything else is. We got our first version of the website released. So just prior to the 510K, we released sort of a sneak peek version of our website. And then when we got the 510K approval, we released the full version. I urge you to go check it out. It's, it's really pretty. Uh, and there's a great demo video on there of the product. Our tech portal. So we have a portal that we're building for our field service technicians out in the field looking at one of these systems. They obviously need access to this data. Right? It's one of those great end user use cases where you go from a mountain on the back end to exactly what somebody needs in their hand. So we got that demonstrated. Um, our customer portal release is coming up. So using that data and giving it back to the people who own the robot. Being able to you know, ingest it and turn it into value for them. You know, somewhat immediately is the goal and just continue to mature that. And then enhance all areas of our architecture, the focus on AI readiness, operational stability, geomobility. The keynote this morning said something about, you know, be cloud agnostic. We made the decision not to be. We made the decision to use a number of AWS-specific services so that we could get delivery speed and free scale. But we know in 2018, as we globalize and we scale out certain parts of what we want to do, we will back off of those managed services and build our own layers with nice big container managed solutions, et cetera. But that's a scale question. We've used this map successfully for over a year with almost no change, which I'm really happy about. Now, there's a number of components that aren't shown here. We didn't know we were going to use Airflow when we drew this map. We had no idea what orchestration tool we were going to use. Uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, Jenkins. I, there's a ton of other core services that aren't on here. Um, but this is the core map that we use and keep going back to. Data platform. So, I said we don't have any of these robots in the field. How do we simulate usage? How do I know that my platform is going to work, or at least start to have some reasonable faith? And frankly, even though we're not selling them in the field, we are using them internally. 
So the engineers have started to come to us and say, hey, listen, I need to use the data platform to do my job. Okay, so we've gotta be at least ready for the internal demand, so what does that look like? So we'll walk you left to right. We do our ingestion. It looks about like this, so you see your little binary cloud. We turn it into these nice little layers of, of CSVs and there's some stuff that goes on there. So in eight weeks of internal usage, these are the stats. Um, this represents a long time in production use. We're ahead of the game in terms of scale. So it's about 400,000 files. They range anywhere from a K to 100 meg. So you know, kind of the Lambda, by the way, in that scenario is phenomenal. Like watching the Lambda function scale as it ingests those is, is quite nice. Now we load stage and profile. So this is the classic kind of ETL loading into huge cue bowl and airflow. This is basically where they take over. So this is getting everything into Hive. Uh, that eight weeks looks like about 25 billion records, uh, 25 billion raw records on disk pre-transform, um, spread across a handful of tables there. Some of the tables are really wide, so it's about 25 trillion data points, about 1,000 plus columns of data across that that's data set. Um, outputs, you know, data structures loaded into Hive. Um, finally, transform and sync, so this is where we're spending a lot of our time now and focus. Um, I feel like we've done kind of a cool thing here using a combination of Kubel and notebooks and the Kubel API and Airflow. So what we're doing is, you know, remember I said end users enablement is the goal there. Everybody says that. And we're trying to figure out how to do that. The users can't do much with this. I mean, it's useful, but what we really want them to do is create their own curation layers. And so we're doing this with a series of notebooks and Airflow. So a user can create a notebook that defines the transformations that they're interested in and as long as it takes the standard set of parameters, they bring it back to me and say, hey, can you put this one into the flow? And then as the daily processing runs, this new transform runs for them, and it also ends up back in Hive, staged where they wanted it. So we haven't gotten to them deploying, just doing their own DAGs, layer after layer of transform, um, but this is that transform and sync layer. Uh, it turns into these quick and ready records, which we measure in the few millions. Eventually, we'll get enough millions that we'll want to do something like Redshift maybe, but right now, a regular old relational database does the job. Um, and this is where we produce all the dashboards and analytics and et cetera. This is a particularly interesting visualization. That's a 3D map of where a user drove our machine through somebody's lung. And the data comes in in that compressed binary format on the left, and then the users, well now they know where it is, and this part is very self-service. They know where it is and they can go find their stuff in S3 and they find the translation and they run it through some script. This was generated out of the Kubel notebook. So the full 3D everything. Um, they helped us get that going on a, a custom cluster. So um, some basic stats for us. Latency right now, so day, today we're doing the daily batch thing. Our target is less than 15 minutes from here to here. And uh, I think we're gonna get there in the next couple weeks. We have some, some changes to make to how we're doing our scheduling. RPM per cluster, what is that? Uh, the clusters are spinning very quickly as it turns out. No, records per minute loaded into a given cluster configuration is going to be you know, one of our key performance metrics. And I have lots of different ways I can get at that and manage that. Airflow makes it easy to get at that. But managing that, starting to turn the knob on financial control, you know, visibility as we head for production, and then dollar per run minute on the system itself. So this robot's running in the field. For every minute that it runs, it pushes data. How much does that data cost all the way through here? And how much value do we get out of it, right? So being able to get enough data to start to have a handle on that, start to calculate some ROI, really excited about that metric. So we do keep this around. We update the statistics on a routine basis. We take it to meetings for people that want to talk about the data platform. What are you guys doing? How does it work? having this consistent story to tell can be really useful. So accelerants and what's working well, technical. AWS, um, I was really blessed. We already had a contract with AWS when I started. Um, and you know, some corporate preference for it. We've taken this you know, very heavy on the managed services approach and so they're our main provider. You know, all of the AAS. All of those, put whatever acronym you, know, P and F and I and all the different letters in front of as a service, and we tend to use them. Now there's use cases where we don't, we don't use QuickSight, we don't use Athena, so we don't use Presto, dedicated clusters in Kubel and some other places where we think that we want a different scaling plan. But generally, that's our, our first go. 
Kubel, cloud magic for data. I can tell you that when I showed up, we, one of the engineers had convinced somebody to sign a contract with Kubel. Nobody was using it. And I went and looked at it the first time I met with, with our, our sales guy, and I wasn't that impressed. Like, I wasn't sure it was going to be a great thing. And I remember I, we talked. I, I remember when I sort of turned the page and said, no, this thing is magic, and this is a key part of our execution strategy. Um, and it continues to be. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that we use all parts of the platform. We don't use the scheduler. We use Airflow. Like, we skipped the Kubel scheduler and jumped all the way to Airflow. We knew our use cases were, were out in that range of edge use cases. Um, but frankly, it's a, it's a key strategy for us. The API works really, really well. So the ability to orchestrate externally and then just run things into Kubel as an engine, having it automatically managing all the infrastructure, it, the first time we ran end-to-end -end load testing and watched the scale, watched the clusters just come up and go back down as we were able to dial the load, it, that's pretty cool. I've never set up a Hadoop cluster myself. And now I don't want to. I know I never have to, right? <laughs> Um, Airflow, uh, you know, uh, you've heard other folks mention it. It's really, it's been a saving grace for us. There's a lot of problems I wasn't sure how I was going to solve. Um, and Airflow has allowed me to solve them very elegantly. I don't use the hosted Airflow in Kubel. Um, we currently run a good sized cluster using the Docker Compose configuration that's out there. If you're in the Airflow community, it's pretty easy to find. Um, we run a medium scaled version of that. Uh, robots framework. So early on, I said document enough and test enough. Um, we have a really small team. I am the only technical employee on the team. We, we brought in some guys early on to do some heavy, C, heavy CI CD lifting, get us a good framework in place, get some great examples laid down, you know, got us going. Um, but if we're a small team, testing is critical. And I can tell you that like, testing in this ecosystem is really interesting. A lot of our stuff doesn't have unit tests, <sighs> right? But it does have coverage with integration tests. Half of what we deploy, there's more configuration than functional code. If you, you know, true multi-environment, multi-account AWS environment, it's very challenging to think about unit testing these little pieces of logic. But integration testing these larger data flows, that's really been a value add for us. I didn't think it would be. I've, I've not done it in other places. But we use Robots Framework. Again, little open source keyword driven framework based on Python, so it met that for me. Easy, easy to extend. Um, and we've been using it all over the place. It's built into our pipelines now. Processes, uh, the SDLC mullet. So, agile up front, waterfall in the back. <laughs> I'm glad you appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> so we started, you know, we started and I had a blank slate and they said go build a thing and we drew a map, but again, you know, a couple of guys, it's my boss sitting there, but you know, a couple of guys in, some time and go, go build a thing, and we're not sure what we need you to build. You have these high-level goals. Remember that freight train. And enable the end user analyst, but you also have to have APIs to feed to a, potentially a third-party tool, right? Like, be ready to do all that stuff. Okay, pretty agile in the front. We swapped components out. Like, we swapped architectures out. We changed things. But now we're getting close to production. Now we're, now we're getting kind of waterfall. We have pretty heavy dates that we stick to. We have lots of investment in integration testing. I wasn't writing robots framework tests a year ago. It would not have been a value add for me. We weren't even sure how it was all going to work yet. But we're getting ready for production, and it better all be integration testing, right? So we, we've switched our focus. If you look at our sprint plans, you'll see more and more focus on testing. And we're not going overboard, but continue to you know, start, to, start to follow the pattern where if somebody reports an issue, make a test for it, right? But do that at the integration layer. I can tell you, in this data space, this is, this is hard. This is more challenging than I thought it would be. But robots, a combination of robots and Kubel and their API have made it easier. So that, that combination of being able to change your uh, SDLC, test enough and write. Like I, talked about, you know, I think I've talked about that enough. But again, attachment to any one testing methodology as a religion is potentially not going to net you all the results you want. We use three different testing frameworks and, and robots tests it all in air quotes. I do traditional J-unit integration testing on Java components. We calculate code coverage in the whole ball of wax, which is the only place we do it. It's the only place it's critical. So um, automated CI, CD, and DevOps at the right time. This is similar to integration testing. Lay it down sooner, but you know, there, we'll talk about this on the next slide too. Um, consistent use of the maps in the language. So we've made those drawings. We have a wiki. 
I've gone this whole presentation without saying domain-driven design. There's a lot of good stuff in there as well. It's not on the input slide too, you'll notice. Missing buzzword. But consistently using the same map, consistently using the same language. If you go into my wiki, if you go into the JIRA, if you go into whatever, the names are on the boxes or the names of the components. The language is the same all the way through. We try to be very consistent with our customer. So get your standards and toolkits early and hold them dear. Right? So I said, first 60 days. For 60 days, we basically laid all this out. This is what we're going to go do. We didn't build an API for another nine months, but we knew we were going to build them. We knew we were going to build them with API Gateway. We knew when we got there, we'd have our CI CD deployment ready to go. Right? So it'd be easy to roll those out. Right? So, and, and then be willing to change them. We swapped out like three major components. Um, we swapped out actually adding new web servers and changing the, the whole way we do that. Right? So be willing to change it if you have compelling evidence. But then balance that, oh, that balance. Balance that against, I have these standards for technology acquisition. Am I, am I trading out what I have for something that anticipates scale and falls at a better place on that hierarchy? Because if so, that's a great trade, right? Gotchas, CICD has some really heavy prerequisites. The last slide I said you should do this right away, et cetera. It's non-trivial. Go find somebody who knows how to do it really well and help you get a good foothold. It doesn't take long. I think we burned maybe 100 or 150 hours um, with some really stellar consultants. I'll tell you who they are afterwards. Um, get that foundation done, but keep in mind that the prerequisites, particularly for managed services, means that you're programming in your CI CD tools. And so until you know what you want to build with a fair degree of certainty, CI CD can slow you down. Because you make this assumption, you know, everything I build has to run through this pipeline. And so we actually build and prototype in a separate account, and then there's a migration step. Now, you also should build knowing that you want to automate, right? So you should follow the best practices for whatever tool and technology you're using. And when you find a thing that doesn't have defined stages like that, Kubel as an example, there, I don't have a dev test QA and prod Kubel. That goes on to actually these next two. So this is, I put this on a gotcha slide, Hive and Spark and, and Presto and et cetera, are large open source ecosystems. And I put this as a gotcha because they're incredibly powerful tools, but you, you pick your provider, so we're going with Kubel, and they take all the heavy lift of making sure that it's a stable release and et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, you have to wait for them to vet the release, right? So there's that trade-off in the size of this ecosystem. Additionally, I have found end user training to be frighteningly difficult because of this. Because what do our end users do? My end users are serious engineers. Uh, they Google it. But they don't know what version of Spark we're on. They don't know what version of Python we're using. They don't know what version of Hive we're using. And so they find the wrong exam. And it's actually a really challenging thing because I don't, I don't have a consistent set of resources. I have a very you know, sprawling ecosystem. So environment management is still hard. So we have a, I'm really proud of our CI CD infrastructure. And it's still really challenging. You have edge systems that don't support all the environments that you want. Uh, you know, case in point for us is our HR system. We have a third-party HR system, and we only have two versions, dev and prod. But I have four environments internally. What to do? You will run into that everywhere. I used to work at a big company, and we had one system that had nine environments. And I, only, I, I ran the integration team. We only had five, and it was a real challenge. So this hasn't gone away. I wish it would, but it hasn't gone away. Um, and then you add in the fact that you need all those secrets and passwords and managing all of that credential and everything and never get any of that into source control ever, right? This is, you know, it, it is a, a bit challenging. There probably isn't a silver bullet. Like this infinite cloud thing demos well. Practically speaking, <laughs> practically speaking, this whole conference is filled with tech talks for people saying, I found the edge of the infinite part and let me tell you what we did to solve that. Right? I mean, the first time I fired up Lambda, I was so excited about it. This thing scales great. I wrote a couple of scripts. Let's throw 10 files. Let's throw 20 files at it. Cool. Let's throw 25,000 files at it. All right. Man, it works great. Let's make it stateful and connect it to a relational database. Yeah, they don't infinitely scale anymore. And all of a sudden, I've got a bottleneck, right? And so as, as you go through your architecture, you think about those, because you're going to have them. You're going to make these trade-offs where you're going to eat something that won't scale very well because it was simple to implement or whatever. But even the things that are silver bullets, 
they're probably not, right? So just be aware, I guess, for me, be aware of that. Don't forget the basics. I, I was a guy who built a data warehouse, and we were championing what we called embedded analysts, self-service. I remember when they started talking about self-service at conferences. A lot of the lessons we learned back there have not gone away. You know, how to do, and get, how to do good data visualization is completely ignorant from the technology you use, whether it's Presto or a SQL Server or whatever, the right visualization is still a critical component in delivering value out of your data. So don't forget that old stuff, right? MDM, a lot of basic processes, you know, ITIL and all these other frameworks, most of them still apply. Uh, and, and I'm really excited to, to see that, um, but it's just, uh, be aware of that. So I guess closing, activated cloud scale big data is more attainable than ever. I've built data warehouses, I've built integration systems, I've built all kinds of on-prem stuff. Um, did some early cloud stuff in Azure. I'm more convinced than ever that this is, it just, it's, it's possible and achievable um, if you make, I think, some good technology and architecture decisions early on um, and going after those, the things that we talked about this morning, serverless and et cetera, et cetera. So, Q&A. There's some more pictures of our product, by the way. So that's the controller, modeled after a game controller. That's the, uh, that's the cart. So those are the robotic arms that actually unfold and hold, the, hold some of the stuff. Uh, there's the touch screen, and you can see a view in the lung, and then multiple different views that uh, uh, let the surgeon navigate. And then that's a... Not an actual photograph, I don't think. That's a rendering of the tip of the scope that navigates down through the airways. How many different movable parts can the doctor control on the scope? So the scope itself is flexible. So it's a flexible, so he actually, he or she actually drives it in three dimensions with the controller. So you drive down, and then you can also control left, right, up, down, and roll. And so it is a, it is a driving experience as you drive down through the lung. We have one in the demo room, like I'll show you the next time you come over to the office. It's, it's a pretty neat experience. Hang on, I didn't do the web part. So all the stuff above that line, the UI stuff, so our very pretty website, I had almost nothing to do with it besides specifying that it must be Angular and some other requirements about the data interactions and authenticate, some like nerd architecture stuff, but the actual fanciness of the website, I had nothing to do with. Don't, yeah, other than that, yes, the rest of it is um, actually, there's one other thing I should say. We're hiring. Uh, <laughs> there's one opening on my team, like, because I need some help. Uh, currently, the, uh, the job title is AWS Senior DevOps Engineer, but it's a big data DevOps, et cetera, et cetera. It's do more of what I do, because yes, I've built all of that all the way through. It's why we picked standard languages early on, and we wanted to stick with AWS. You know, if you stick with AWS, then your technical capability I don't have to ask the question about how I'm going to integrate with it. I'm going to use Python and Bot03, and, and I know it'll work, right? And, and so it's, it's given us a bunch of speed there as being able to, it's, it's the, one of the few times in my career when single vendor sourcing in that way has paid a huge dividend. Did you set up the architecture or you actually integrated the data from different, it's not just from the robot? Just the robot right now. Just the robot, just the robot right now. So, I'm in engineering, which is awesome. I'm not in IT. And so we think about this more from a product management standpoint, and we're really focused on the product. Additionally, I don't have any transactional data. I don't have sales data. I don't have operational data. I mean, we're just beginning to get operational data from manufacturing. But I don't have all of those traditional kind of data management problems that you see in an organization. I'm very much starting from scratch with just the robot data as the primary source of value. Yeah, it's a huge benefit. <laughs> Like, to start with no legacy in place is a pretty big accelerant on its own. Brian, thanks a lot. Thank you.